All right, man, peace. So as most of you brothers know who follow the NBA, one of the main narratives, one of the main storylines that simply won't die, won't go away, is this Michael Jordan versus LeBron James debate, or alleged debate. Well, Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets, has decided that he's going to chime in on it. And I do believe that he has an ulterior motive. There's a method to his madness in regards to why he has decided to chime in in the way that he has. And that's because as a general manager, as an astute general manager, you have to be thinking two or three steps ahead of the competition. And he understands that the team that he currently has now on the Rockets is a team that he may have to blow up, especially if they fall short in this up and coming NBA season. And it is a relatively high possibility that they will come up short this up and coming regular season into the playoffs because they have Chris Paul, a 33 going on 34 year old point guard. They have Carmelo Anthony, a player who pretty much is done. And they have James Harden, a player who has a history of coming up short in the most pivotal moments in the playoffs. So just to get back to the point, Daryl Morey has decided to chime in on the Michael Jordan versus LeBron James debate. And according to Daryl Morey, LeBron James is ahead of Michael Jordan by a sizable margin. That's according to Daryl Morey. But why is he saying that? Because Michael Jordan is not playing today and he has not played for 15 years. LeBron James is still playing in today's NBA and he's still widely considered the best player in the league. So I believe that Daryl Morey believes that he may have an outside chance to have LeBron James relocate to the Houston Rockets. So of course he's going to say that LeBron James has a sizable margin over Michael Jordan in regards to the greatest player of all time debate. In addition to that, LeBron James plays the game today pretty much at the pinnacle of what a general manager like a Daryl Morey would want from a player. I've stated this in other videos. Pretty much Russell Westbrook and James Harden play the LeBron James system on their own team. They're just not as good as LeBron James. So anyway, they're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. For Sports Center right now, I'm Victoria Arlen. There is no doubt that LeBron James is one of the greatest NBA players in the league. But is he the best of all time? Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey thinks so. You just look at his ability to, you know, generate wins and championship probability over time and, and basically break that down. And obviously, you don't need all the numbers. You can watch as well and see that. But Now, did you guys just hear that? Daryl Morey is Mr. Analytics. He stated, we don't need all the numbers. We can just watch. Now, the eye test is something that I believe is definitely a parameter in evaluating great athletes. But it should never be the number one parameter. What you'll find is that people who know that they don't have any empirical data to back up their claims will always run to the eye test. Kobe Bryant fans are known for this. They'll tell you, yeah, we know that Kobe Bryant did not shoot well from the field, but he had the clutchness. His handle was so great. He had ice water in his veins. There's always a bunch of intangibles with people who know that they don't have enough empirical data to back up what they're saying. And Daryl Morey knows that by any and all analytics, Michael Jordan is still a greater player than LeBron James, and he's an analytical guy. As a matter of fact, he's one of the main general managers that has made analytics one of the foremost avenues that general managers and top executives on these NBA teams used to evaluate not just their players, but their coaches as well. So for him to decide that he's going to move away from the analytics argument and go towards the eye test argument should show you that he has an ulterior motive. And I'm not mad at him because I think that he does have an extremely outside chance at LeBron James. Of course, not for this season because he signed with the Lakers. But as we all know, LeBron James always negotiates outs in his contract. So Daryl Morey, certainly has a method to his madness. But if you, if you basically isolate that and also look at the career he's had, um, you know, frankly, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's at this point it's become a bit of a big margin, actually, where he's, he's come out ahead. I know that's a little controversial. No, it's not controversial when one understands what your motives are. For you to say that LeBron James is greater than Michael Jordan, that's your opinion, but to say that it's by a large margin, it's obvious that you're just putting some frosting on the cake because you're hoping that you have a chance to sign LeBron James and maybe even upgrade from James Harden. Once again, this is a pivotal year for the Houston Rockets. And to me, based on Daryl Morey's comments about LeBron James, he's confirming this. 
do not be surprised to see Daryl Morey try to move on from that entire team, that entire roster, if they flame out. Now let's toss it back to first take. Well, 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 fellas, Rockets GM Daryl Morey says LeBron is the GOAT by a big margin. Stephen A., let me ask you this. Can the Kings still do anything to pass MJ as the GOAT? Well, of course, LeBron James cannot do anything to pass Michael Jordan as the greatest player in NBA history, or at least widely considered the greatest player in modern NBA history. He can't do anything in my view. But in regards to the propaganda machine and the liberal sports media aided by Nike, etc., if he were to win a couple of championships with the Lakers and end his career with five championships, having won at least one championship on three separate NBA teams, he'll certainly be able to create a case and an argument that will be utilized by the factions that sponsor him to promote him as the greatest player ever because what they'll do is they'll mix that with the wokeism aspect. Look at what he does for his community. Look at how he speaks out against injustice, quote unquote. And they'll try to put that all together into a little gumbo and say we have to put him above Michael Jordan. As a matter of fact, I remember as a kid, ESPN had the top 50 greatest athletes of the 20th century. For those of you guys who are old enough to remember, Back in 1999, as 1999 was coming to a close, ESPN had a list of the 50 greatest athletes of the 20th century. I believe they called it Sports Century. And Michael Jordan ended up being number one. If they were to redo that list today, I guarantee you they would not put him at number one. They would put Muhammad Ali at number one. Because ESPN has become such a super liberal sports network and they're so interested in athletes that are woke, I have no doubt that they would have Muhammad Ali as the number one greatest athlete in sports history over Michael Jordan if they were to do the list today? No, not to me. Uh, it's a very, very simple quiet answer to me. Um, um, when you lose six NBA finals, there's nothing, for, there's nothing to talk about. I'm not Thank you, sir. And to me, that's the bottom line of it. I don't even mind him losing six finals because, of course, the contention will be that he's faced great teams. That's true. He has faced great teams. And when I say great teams, I mean teams that were smart. The San Antonio Spurs were smarter than his team. That's what made their greatness. Now, if you put the San Antonio Spurs from the 2000s, if you move them to the 1990s or 1980s, they're still a very good to great team, but I don't know if they win a championship. Because once again, for those of you brothers that remember, in 1998, the Utah Jazz, that team that's so maligned that supposedly they had a bunch of white boys on the team, the Utah Jazz were able to defeat the San Antonio Spurs with Tim Duncan and David Robinson on it. They beat them in five games in 1998, five or six games. And this is with a 35-year-old John Stockton and a 35-year-old Karl Malone. So LeBron James' weakness in the finals has always been teams with high basketball IQ. Always. And even Phil Jackson, once again, when he took over as coach of the Lakers, he wanted to avoid the Utah Jazz in the playoffs. And this is in 2000 with a Carl Malone and a John Stockton that were 37 years old because he knew that his Laker team was not good with basketball IQ. Despite how much film Kobe Bryant tries to break down today and act like he's a wizard when it comes to basketball IQ, back then everybody knew that you could break the Lakers down mentally because that was not their strong suit. Their strong suit was their athleticism and their overall basketball talent. But once again, just getting back to LeBron James, he's 3-6 and six in the finals. That's the bottom line of it. And if we're going to start giving certain NBA players, no matter how great they are, credit just for getting there, then we have to bump Jerry West and Elgin Baylor up the ranks of all-time greatest players. They both have to be in the top 10 because Jerry West was 1-8 in, in the finals. So I don't understand why LeBron James can be number one all-time in the NBA's history just because he got to nine finals. But Jerry West, on most people's list, will probably barely crack the top 20. I'm not questioning the greatness of LeBron James in terms of, you know, his overall skill set and his overall impact to winning and losing basketball games. That's undeniable. Um, I think that it's a debate as to whether he's number two or number one on Mount Rushmore basketball, to be quite honest with you, because I think... I think that it's a debate whether or not LeBron James is top five all time. I don't think that there's any debate in regards to one or two. There's just not. I don't understand how you could even think to put him on the Jordan, Kareem, Bill Russell level. Now, when you get to Magic and Larry Bird, I think that you can argue because of LeBron James' athleticism over those two players and the fact that he's more known for being a defensive stalwart than those two players were. 
even though I think a lot of that is perception because Larry Bird was an underrated defender and LeBron James is a bit of an overrated defender even though his years in Miami he was a stalwart on defense but I just don't think that you can make a compelling argument for LeBron James over Jordan, Kareem, or Bill Russell. Bill Russell and Kareem both won titles in high school, college, and the professionals, and won in the Olympics as well. So it's not like their success in basketball is just limited to the NBA. I think he's that great. We can't deny that. But there are too many moments uh, along the road where he came up a bit small. That's not to say that Jordan was perfect that there weren't times when he struggled. But when the moments mattered most and he was called upon to deliver, he rarely, if ever, let us down. Jordan went seven consecutive years, averaging 30 plus. For 13 years in Chicago, he shot 50.5% from the field, uh, which is a better overall field goal shooting percentage than LeBron James, by the way. He was a nine time first team all defensive player. Please understand something. After Michael Jordan's 13 years in Chicago, he retired at 35 years old. His shooting percentage was 51.5% after 13 years in Chicago. It was those two years in Washington that has his shooting percentage hovering at around 50%. But once again, had it not been for his comeback with the Washington Wizards, his player efficiency ratings and his proficiency ratings would have been straight through the roof. Would have been unbelievable numbers. Uh, he didn't take time off defensively. Uh, he usually he embraced uh, 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 the toughest defensive assignment night in, night out. During well, that's not always true. In his last season, Pippen and Harper would oftentimes embrace the toughest defensive assignments on the perimeter. But what Jordan would do is he would guard whatever other perimeter player was there, and he would be the, the number one defensive player metric-wise at his position. In 1998, I believe it was top five or top six in the NBA in regards to defensive efficiency during many occasions throughout his career. And for me personally, um, even though I can understand how people can look at LeBron 6'9", 260, a locomotive coming at you, a physical specimen, the likes of which we haven't seen this side of Will Chamberlain and Shaquille O'Neal, basically. Oh, look at that. Do you brothers notice the preponderance of television NBA pundits who are now stealing my analogy of LeBron James being the modern day version of Shaquille O'Neal and Will Chamberlain? I was saying this a year ago, and guys were coming on my channel. How could you say that? LeBron James is not a center. What are you talking about? I'm talking about in regards to overall physical dominance, that archetype that he represents of being the preeminent physical force in the league, pretty much being unassailable in regards to his physical dominance. That is LeBron James' archetype. That's his role. That's the paradigm that he subscribes to. That Wilt Chamberlain slash Shaquille O'Neal Goliath figure in the NBA. And a lot of these guys on television are picking up on it. Basically, at the end of the day, Jordan didn't have that at his disposal, still did what he did, still rose to the occasion in big moments, was unblemished and undefeated in NBA Finals, never even allowed the Finals to get to a seventh game, was the ultimate assassin. Um, and I look at those things and I say, whatever LeBron James does, without questioning his greatness in any way, when you bring up Jordan comparisons, there are too many down moments that he had that we would never associate with Michael Jordan. It's Absolutely. And beyond that, there's too much excuse making made for LeBron James. Way too much excuse making. Just accept the fact that he lost. Accept the fact that he flamed out in 2010 against the Boston Celtics because his mother was getting banged out by one of his teammates, allegedly. Accept the fact that in 2011, he had a nuclear meltdown for whatever reason. There have been some innuendo in regards to why he had the meltdown in 2011. Just accept that. In 2014, his team got blitzkrieged off the floor by the San Antonio Spurs. In 2015, unfortunately for him, some of the core members of the Cleveland Cavaliers went down with injury. In 2016, he was very, very fortunate. Things came together for him to win that championship. And in 2017, 2018, he just got totally blown off the floor. The LeBron James system never works against great teams. And when I say great teams, I'm talking about teams with high basketball IQ, not even just with a talent advantage. It's not even a debate to me. The answer is yes, there are things LeBron James can do to become the GOAT, but he's not the GOAT yet. 
And Daryl Morey is simply incorrect about this. And I won't even veer away from analytics. I'll use analytics. Now, it's possible that Daryl Morey, maybe even likely, is looking at different analytics than I have access to. I doubt that because if Daryl Morey was looking at higher level analytics than what you have access to, Max Kellerman, he would have mentioned it in the interview. The reason why he took the eye test route is because he does not have any empirical data to prove his point. Because he's the GM of the Houston Rockets, and that's an analytically based uh, organization. He makes very good use of them. Not only does he make very good use of analytics, he pretty much is viewed as the general manager that made analytics one of the primary methods that you use to evaluate talent and to evaluate style of play. So that's how you know that when you omit any other factor in regards to why he would make the statement that he made in the way that he made it, it must be because he has the ulterior motive of thinking that he has the outside chance of being able to acquire Mr. LeBron James in the offseason. That's the only conclusion that I can come to. Uh, nevertheless, the most sophisticated cutting-edge analytics that I've seen say that in their primes, Michael Jordan was better than LeBron James. In other words, he's hit a higher peak. That's really what we mean when we say greatest of all time. Absolutely, from the 1986-87 season all the way to the 92-93 season, which is widely considered Michael Jordan's peak physically as an NBA player. His player efficiency ratings, his scoring average, his defensive efficiency has never really even been approached in the history of the NBA. When you're talking about the things that Michael Jordan has done, you have to compare him to players like Wilt Chamberlain in regards to the effect that he had on the floor. And that's the fact of the matter. I believe what Daryl Morey is talking about is essentially counting win shares, if you will. And given the fact that LeBron's peak is close to Jordan's, and yet it lasted much, much longer, now Daryl Morey can say, when I add up the win shares, or, the, or add up the years that he increased our win probability, or championship probability, I have more value on the LeBron side of the ledger than on the Jordan side of the ledger. Right, but are we evaluating win probability or win actuality? Because when we have a real discussion, we have to utilize real events and real facts. It's nice to talk about probability. Probability is about things that you're hoping will occur in the future. When we're having a discussion where we're trying to compare and contrast two players that actually play and existed, we have to evaluate what has already occurred. So we have to go by win actuality, not win probability. So we know in actuality, Michael Jordan is 6-0 in the finals. He's never gone down to a team that he was expected to defeat. We can't say the same thing about LeBron James. That's the fact of the matter. That's not what most of us mean. It doesn't mean that, like, you know, like Bill Walton was the greatest anyone's ever seen for one year. We're not talking about those guys. But if you hit the highest peak anyone's ever hit, all alone on that peak, which Jordan did, again, according to the analytics, and you sustain that for a reasonable period of time, in Jordan's case, at least six years, I would argue he was by far the best player in the world before he won a championship. And we could. Once again, just to bolster some of the statements that Max Kellerman is making, and I bring this up all the time, in the 1987-88 season, Michael Jordan averaged 35 points a game at shooting guard, at shooting guard, and shot 53.5% from the field at shooting guard, and led the league in steals. So not only did he win the NBA regular season MVP, he was the MVP of the All-Star game, he won the slam dunk contest, he led the league in steals, and was defensive player of the year. No other player in the history of the league has ever done all those things in the same season. We can debate that another time. That makes you the GOAT. Now, what can LeBron do to pass Jordan? He can do the impossible, Stephen A., because you think that's impossible. He can do he, nothing he can do. Me too, right? I thought that about LeBron in the past. It's impossible. How are those Cavs going to beat those Golden State Warriors? Well, we know how that happened, Max Kellerman. Draymond Donkey Green made one of the worst decisions that a player has ever made in a big moment, and it hurt his irreparably in regards to that season. But I tell you this, had the Golden State Warriors defeated LeBron James in 2016, they may not have won in 2017 or 2018. Who knows? figured out a way to do it. If he somehow goes to L.A., for example, this year where he is, and with that squad beats the Golden State Warriors, who just added the fifth Infinity Stone with Boogie Cousins, you know, if he's healthy by the playoffs. Now, if that wasn't a carry, I don't know what was. 
how you gonna cuff the ball, do a spin, basically a reverse pirouette, and then put the ball back down on the ground, and that's not a travel? Like, come on. If he overcomes that in these playoffs, reestablishes the Lakers as the brand in basketball, as a championship dynasty, spends three years there, wins a couple championships, at a certain point you gotta say, damn, LeBron's prime wasn't even when we thought it would be. He actually entered his prime later and got even better. If he can do something like that, which I don't think he can, he'll be the GOAT. Otherwise, he's still never been as good as Jordan at his best, who was at his best for many years. The debate ultimately brings into question the performance against the Dallas Mavericks in 2011. That's the bottom line of it, Stephen A. Smith. That's really all you need. You can list some other situations, some other scenarios, some other occasions, but 2011, his performance against the Dallas Mavericks was so disappointing. I was rooting so hard for that brother to win his first championship and to be able to come against the naysayers who were trying to lambaste him for his decision to utilize his free agency rights, and he disappointed me so bad. It brings into question six finals losses overall. It brings into question the 40 to 71 point difference in a five game loss to the San Antonio Spurs when the Spurs ran Miami out of one building after another. One thing I'll say about that series is that Dwayne Wade did not look like himself. I'm not sure what was going on with him. If he was having an adverse reaction to some type of prescription for injuries that he may have been dealing with. But he looked like he was not even working out. His body was doughy, his face was fleshy, and he had round cheeks. He looked like he had not even been training for basketball, much less being ready to compete in the NBA Finals. LeBron James played about as well as he could play. LeBron has never been on the level of a Michael Jordan. He came out in that series and did his normal average about 25, 7, and 7, which he's always going to do because he's bigger than everyone and he has the ball in his hands all the time. But was LeBron good in that 2014 NBA Finals against the Spurs? No, he was not. No, he was not. There were numerous players on the Spurs that outplayed him in that series. And he also, of course, had that cramping issue, I believe, in Game 1. So. It brings into question all of those different things along the way, not to mention the rules changes that have taken place within the NBA where you can get called for a foul for having bad breath for crying out loud. Um, the, how considerably softer the game is and how it's more facilitated for uh, relatively offensive-minded players than ever before. I agree with that, Stephen A. Smith, but I think that the main reason why the league is more offensive today is because your four and your five men are expected to be able to stretch the floor, which opens up the paint. It's easier to get to the bucket today than it ever was. All you have to do is beat your defender. Back in the 80s and 90s, when you drove to the paint, oftentimes you had to beat two or three guys. And it also takes into account what you do defensively. If you were performing at an elite level defensively in this day and age, where again, you can get called for a foul for passing gas, the way a Kawhi Leonard, when healthy, accepts every tough defensive assignment, your arguments would be stronger. If you want to ignore how like, like Michael Jordan would, could average 50 or 60 in today's game, because... Well, let's not be ludicrous. Michael Jordan cannot average 50 or 60 in today's game. And to be quite frank with you, when people make those type of statements, they take away a lot of credibility from what they say. Because Michael Jordan was phenomenal. Do I believe that he's the greatest player overall of the modern day era? Yes, I do. I don't think that it's by a particularly wide margin. I think that you can make a compelling argument for Magic Johnson even, if you truly wanted to. And if we wanted to make basketball IQ a primary barometer, you could make a case for Larry Bird. Larry Bird's best stretch of his career from 83 to 88 is up there with any player that's ever played in the league. But once again, I do believe that Jordan is the best that I've seen. Do I believe that he could average 50 or 60 points a game in today's NBA? Absolutely not. It's ludicrous to even think that or say that. It's dismissive and it's disrespectful to today's NBA players. And it's just plain silly. Because of the ways the rules you know, sort of paves the way for offensive-minded players to really have their way, then that would be different. But those things are not the case. Those changes have taken place. They've been implemented. It facilitates things to make things easier for offensive-minded players, particularly with somebody like LeBron James, who does get hacked a lot or whatever, but creates a lot of the contact that comes his way. I agree with that. 
Every time that LeBron James drives to the basket, he drives in the mode of a running back and not a basketball player. And it amazes me how little his offhand pushes get called by the referees because he's constantly pushing his defender with his offhand when he drives to the lane. Wait, it's not like he's sitting innocently by and getting hacked. He creates that contact as well. All of those things come into play that make me say, I would never question your greatness. I would never question Shit, yeah. how great you are overall, but I'm not going to label you the GOAT when you have so many down moments to point to, and Michael Jordan does not have those moments. I'm just not going to I'll say it. something else about Jordan. And I understand Daryl Morey's win probability added, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, like basketball, the NBA, NBA basketball in particular, I don't think is fundamentally probabilistic. Maybe now more than it used to be because of so many threes, it's a low percentage shot. So on the margins, it does make a difference. But when Jordan played mm -hmm. in particular, it was fundamentally deterministic, meaning the best team always won. When Jordan was in his prime and he had a squad, he never didn't win the championship. He always won. In fact, the first time he played with another All-Star, never had played with an All-Star until Scottie Pippen made his first All-Star team. They went to a game seven against the defending champion Pistons, who would repeat that year. And the only reason they lost game seven is because his All-Star, Scottie Pippen, couldn't play with a migraine. No, sir. The reason why the Bulls lost game seven in Detroit in 1990 is because they were not ready yet. The Detroit Pistons were still the better team. That's why they lost in 1990. So the idea of probability, LeBron makes it more likely that you win. If Jordan had a squad, he always won every time. It wasn't probabilistic. Well, the one thing, the, Jordan the, 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 made it the one thing, the, Yeah, I got it. Probabilistic. I got to look that up. Here's the deal. The bottom line is this. Daryl Morey brings up uh, LeBron James, and this is the one thing that I don't think he mentions. James Harden. Who, from an, from an offensive standpoint, who does he mirror more, Michael Jordan or LeBron James? It's Michael Jordan. No, sir. Max Kellerman is correct on that. James Harden mimics LeBron James. He does not mimic Michael Jordan. James Harden's game is almost entirely face-up. Michael Jordan's offensive game was totally diverse, as was his defensive game. Michael Jordan could play you straight up on defense. He can go for the steal. He was a great help defender. On offense, he could post you up. He had great mid-range. He could drive to the basket with either hand. And also, later on in his career, from about 1989 onward, he was a relatively underrated three-point shooter in an era that really was not predicated on taking three-point shots off the dribble. So no, James Harden's game has very little in common with Michael Jordan. As I've already stated, James Harden and Russell Westbrook, they played the LeBron James style of offense. James Harden is a scorer. No, no, he's a, no uh, he's a, uh, James Harden is a scoring machine. That's all I mean. LeBron James is multifaceted. He scores, but in the same breath, he's talking about making the right play. Not that James Harden can't play the point, but understand that from an offensive-minded standpoint, James Harden is more similar towards MJ than he would be towards LeBron in terms of just being having a scorer's mentality. My point is that's who Daryl Morey went out to get in an effort to compete with and ultimately beat a team like the Golden well, State Warriors. Available. So Thank you, sir. Exactly, Max Kellerman. That's who was available. Stephen A. Smith is trying to frame his statement or his sentiment as if Daryl Morey had the option to bring on LeBron James or James Harden, and he chose James Harden. That's not the case. And once again, James Harden does not play like Michael Jordan. He plays a lot more like LeBron James than he does Michael Jordan. The reason why he averages so many rebounds and assists is because when you have the ball in your hand that much, and also when you, when you shoot the basketball, and there's not a five-man or a four-man under the basket waiting for the rebound, you can accumulate stats like that. It's much easier to get triple-doubles in today's NBA. That's why you have a Russell Westbrook and a James Hardhead getting a lot more triple-doubles, as well as a LeBron James, because they all play in the same style. They play in the same way. Michael Jordan's game was far more diverse. So to me, that's something, that, well, 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 first of all, he wasn't the only thing available, but he was the best available, and you went out and got him because he's a scoring machine, and James Harden, even when he was a backup point guard and shooting guard in OKC, Daryl Morey saw a dude that could be the face of a franchise that could average 25 a night, and James Harden proved him right. If, if, if LeBron James 
wins the championship with this squad this year against a, a healthy Warriors team. Let's say Boogie gets yeah. back and he's amazing and this is impossible and LeBron beats him anyway. I don't think that'll happen. But if he does, Stephen A, and he gets even better than he's ever been, okay. which is All right. highly unlike, but if he does it, he's still not the GOAT at a certain point. At a certain point, you guys have to stop making up these hypothetical scenarios where LeBron James could be considered the GOAT. Because the last two years, you guys have been asking the same hypothetical question. When I say you guys, I'm talking about the LeBron James super fans and the liberal sports media. Well, if LeBron is able to defeat a Golden State Warriors team with Kevin Durant on it, we have to consider him the GOAT. You guys said that in 2016 and 2017. Now we're in 2018. You're saying the same shit. It's not going to happen. The last two times that he's played them in the finals, his record is 1-8. and eight. Okay? That's his record. I'm not Molly, Max, Max, Max if he did it you, three you, years you, in a you, row, if he, got, if he did three straight, then, uh, then maybe he would be the GOAT. But just one's not going to do well, it. Since, well, shit, if your aunt had a dick, she'd be your uncle. I mean, how many ifs are we going to give? That's we're entertaining ifs, Molly. How about this one? What if Michael Jordan hadn't retired to play baseball for a couple of years? They probably would have won eight straight because I don't think Houston would have yep. came a large one, would have beat yeah, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. We don't You're bring right. that up. We mm -hmm. rave about LeBron going to eight straight NBA finals in a weak Eastern Conference. Yeah. We don't. That would have been a great series, though. Had the Rockets played the Bulls in 94 or 95, that would have been a very compelling series. Now, there are many Jordan quote unquote haters or detractors. Who state that well the rockets were very successful against the bulls in a regular season in 91 and 92 and 93 and they were they did a very good job on the bulls in the regular season but the postseason is completely different and when you have time to game plan i believe that the bulls would have guarded elijah on one on one and if they did double team him they would not have double teamed off of the perimeter players they would have double teamed off of otis thorpe that's just my view of it. They would have double teamed Hakeem Olajuwon with Horace Grant. They would not have doubled down with Michael Jordan and Pippen and left the three-point shooters open. And they would have made Olajuwon have to beat them and figure out where the double team was coming from. Please keep in mind that in the 92-93 season, the Bulls were 1-3 against the Knicks in the regular season. And in the postseason, they beat them in six games. We don't bring up the fact that Jordan would have won eight straight then. How about that? Yeah, but, but, but that's, that's on MJ. He decided not to play. I mean, like, that, all that stuff that goes into the mix and we figure it out. And it's it on the problem what he saying. did early in his career. All right, and it's MJ's on him what he did early in his career. Oh, all right, we'll, we'll save it for another time. Please, I'm sure we'll have this one again. Um, but guys, Yeah, I'm sure of it as well. Guys, on, on a much more serious note, before we go to... But anyway, that's basically it on that. We'll see what comes of this whole Daryl Morey, LeBron James love affair. Do I think that LeBron is going to go to the Rockets? No, I don't. I think that there are many reasons why he's with the Lakers and not just basketball. As a matter of fact, I think that basketball is probably the third or fourth reason on the list in regards to why he went out to play with the Lakers. So peace.